Hi friends, this is John and this is the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast where we talk about agronomic science and cultural management practices that have the capacity to regenerate soil health and plant health and livestock health and ultimately of course public health. And in order for us to sustain that, and this, this whole ecosystem of constantly improving or we could say constantly regenerating um, health and quality of life for all beings, that also means we need to regenerate ecosystems and landscapes, and it means we need to have a sustainable uh, monetary system to be able to do that, including paying for and supporting all of us farmers who are doing that. So anyway, there's lots that can tie into this topic, and I'm broadening my intro longer than normal. It's it's about more than just the uh, ecology and the landscape, it's also the financial ecosystem that allows all of that to function well, and which hasn't allowed it to function quite so well up to this point, but that might be a conversation for another day. I'm really excited to um, be back here and to be talking with all of you again. My guest for this episode is Aaron Silva from the University of Wisconsin, who many of you may have heard of, and if you haven't, then I'm very delighted to introduce you. Aaron has really been a pioneer in bringing about the adoption of uh, weed control methods for organic systems using roller crimper and using uh, cover crop rye, but also a lot more than that. She's known for some of those things, but she's done much greater work than that. So Aaron, for those of us who are less familiar with your work, tell us a bit about your story, your background. What is it that brought you here? How did you get to be doing this work that you've been doing for the last decade? Yeah, well, first, thank you for having me on. It's uh, been um, a bit of a challenge to find time to get together and chat, but uh, having listened to your podcast, I'm really delighted to have a chance to visit with you and uh, talk together about regenerative agriculture and all the, the benefits that it can bring. Um, I've been working in organic agriculture since about 2003. Uh, I did not grow up on a farm. I, I grew up um, close to a city, uh, grew up close to Boston. and But even with my more suburban upbringing, I was exposed to organic gardening quite early on. I, I still remember as a child working out in our, our garden, our, our large garden in an old farmhouse that we uh, owned as a kid and having my own little plots where I'd grow tomatoes and green beans and walking out there and picking the vegetables and leafing through my mother's uh, organic gardening magazines, the old Rodale magazines. So that was my first exposure to organic gardening and um, being a uh, familiar with growing our own food and um, the just the, the, the joy and the uh, work that goes into um, producing food at a homestead farm level. Uh, but from there, um, didn't go into um, my um, academic career thinking I was necessarily going to go into agriculture, but really had more of an interest in environmental science and ecology um, and understanding just how these complex systems work um, that are really driving our uh, the world around us. Uh, and from there, had the opportunity to work in a laboratory at the University of Wisconsin-Madison when I was an undergrad. And at that time, there was a, a graduate student that was a uh, a real leader in organic agriculture still um, that exposed me again early on to organic agriculture and, and how it contributed positively to um, promoting and driving forward sustainable food systems. Uh, and from there, um, it really caught on to working in agriculture and farming and seeing the connection of growing food and ecology and just all the complex interactions that happen when we make our production choices in terms of the crops that we grow and the way that we manage our soils um, and the, the broader ecosystem of even the communities that are involved in growing that food. So it's been a kind of a, a circuitous journey, I guess, into agriculture, not necessarily a straightforward one. But I think that honestly, that initial connection between ecology 
and uh, agriculture uh, has really benefited me as I uh, continue to work in organic agriculture and now more in the regenerative agriculture sphere. You know, I find it really interesting. We've been asked to work on developing curriculum for regenerative agriculture courses for two-year and four-year degrees by a couple of community colleges. And one of the collaborators in developing this curriculum has really emphasized that uh, one of the fundamental differences between really understanding this different worldview is what he describes as ecological literacy. And in studying the work that he was bringing forward, it, it occurred to me that, you know, maybe this is something that's even missing from mainstream agriculture. It, sh it should be inherent in our agricultural worldview. But in fact, maybe we're not fully ecologically literate the way we might be. Yeah, that's really an interesting way of looking at it. I, I, I think oftentimes when we think of the environment and, and agriculture, those two concepts can be at odds. And I think there's historical reasons why that that is with uh, issues res with respect to land management and policy and prioritizing you know, how how land is is utilized and uh, you know, obviously different complex aspects of regulation and other issues that I think we still face as a, a agricultural community. But I, I think that the recognition over the past decade of the critical aspects of biology when it comes to the agricultural ecosystem, I, I think that is really a help to connect how agriculture and ecology come together. I, I think you know, over the uh, decades you know, prior uh, to this recognition of how critical biology is to a well-functioning agricultural system, uh, we thought of agriculture as very much um, more of a, a, a linear type system where we put in a input and then there was a, a certain um, direct action. But I, I think that we recognize more and more how our actions on the land and how we manage our soils and manage our plants um, you know, really more mimic how we manage, even from a um, human health standpoint, our, our own health and, and what we can do to promote the, the soil biological ecosystem like we promote our gut health by the foods that we eat, uh, by promoting um, the plant immune system, by uh, making sure that the, the plant has what it needs to be able to avoid stress um, the same way that we uh, do what we can to avoid stress and again, eat what we can and, and put ourselves in a condition where we can better fight um, disease and illness. I mean, those same parallels exist in our agricultural system. And it's it's certainly more complex than applying an input and then having a, a, a plant response that is more uh, dr driven by a, a chemical reaction, so to speak. Uh, and I, I think that, that that parallel, I think, has really kind of connected the complexity of you know, what what are management uh, and how do we optimize management to increase this function with respect to biology and plant performance as it relates to plant resilience and the ability to be able to naturally resist some of the stresses that um, we, we face in our agricultural production systems. Yeah, you, you raise such an important perspective as farmers and, and even in, in our work at Advancing Eco-Agriculture, we, we see this constantly. There is this expectation of inputs equals certain outputs, kind of this, this linear mechanistic worldview, if you will, that if I apply X, I need to be confident of being able to observe result Y. And uh, that becomes a lot more fuzzy in a, in a biological world rather than in a, than in a chemistry world. And uh, there's lots of cumulative stuff that can happen or cannot happen. And uh, I, I find it interesting as uh, obviously we, we live in a world where the changes that we want to make or need to make in our systems need to deliver economic results for growers. That's fundamental. But um, sometimes the route to those results is not linear. And uh, 
that's, I think, a, a growing awareness, but something that uh, newcomers to the space still really grapple with at times. Yes, I mean, I very much agree. Uh, having done research for over 15 years now, coming on to 20 years in organic production systems, um, I mean, it's an aspect of these systems that make this sort of research exciting, but I think it also presents a challenge with respect to how we do the research and then how that translates to farmer recommendation. And I, I've certainly seen that with respect to the research that we do with respect to soil management, um, but also the, with the work that I've been doing with organic uh, no-till as well. Um, and I, I think you know, as we look at how these management practices translate in these uh, more biologically, ecologically driven systems, it's so context dependent. Um, and I, I know as we look at the health principles, I mean, that is being added on, um, that context is, is critically important when we think about what we're doing and how we're doing it. But it's it's not as uh, simple as I think some of the trials that we see with a synthetic pesticide where you do X, you get Y result. Um, depending on the conditions of a given year or the uh, inherent biology that is present uh, or the genetics of the plant, the outcomes can be different. And, and that is, is not necessarily a, a bad thing, but I think as we look at how that translates into best management practices and communicating with farmers the, the uh, likely outcomes and reducing risk, um, it's an important thing to consider. And I think we need to change the way we think about you know, making recommendations or what our expectations are. Well, it's, it is when we consider the context that means if, if we translate what that really means, it means we need to change the parameters that we're studying or uh, the parameters that we want to implement, the practices or products that we want to use on our farming operation from an individual single focus to a multi-factor focus. And, and this quote unquote, the scientific method has evolved over the last seven or eight decades to largely focused, at least in this context, to largely focus on single factor analysis. We're going to just change this one thing and then see what how everything else changes. But in reality, that's that's not how living systems work. You can't, it's impossible to change just one thing. If you change just one thing, then the whole system moves. And this is when when we look at research, it's, it's a lot more challenging to do systems research in agriculture than it is to do single factor research. And yet for this different paradigm to really thrive, that is what is needed both from a research perspective and from a practical implementation perspective. Absolutely. Um, and I think that as we are able to uh, develop frameworks in which we can better capture performance over a larger uh, set of environments and have these communities of practice where we can bring uh, observation as well as replicated trials together, that we can start to be able to see patterns and trends. But it certainly is a deviation from how we've traditionally done research at the university which tends to focus uh, more on a, a single site and limited number of environments and limited timeframes. And this certainly isn't always the case, so I, I don't want to oversimplify, but I, I think that, like you're saying, I mean, with these ecological systems, I think that the time frames that we need to be making observations over and the number of environments we need to be considering are just multifold, even from what we have been doing more in our traditional agricultural uh, research um, approaches. So it's it's it really kind of takes takes that need to another level again, particularly with respect to biology, where biology is going to evolve um, and it, it isn't static. So as we look at making these changes in the way we manage our soils and what we're doing with respect to um, crop management, the diversity of crops we grow, the cover crops we use, how we're managing residues, 
uh, that is not only going to change depending on the, the year, depending on the um, precipitation or temperature, it's also going to change as that system matures and the, the, the biology continues to evolve in response to management. So when we consider all of this context, uh, I'd, I'd like to bring the conversation back around to your story and the impact that you've been able to have in this overarching ecosystem, because I know that there are many farmers who are good friends of mine across the Midwest who give you a lot of credit for stimulating them on their journey or kind of triggering them to take the next step and to really go down this pathway, particularly in regards to organic no-till. Um, I know that uh, others have also done work and, and helped popularize it, but it's my perception that you perhaps more than anyone helped to really figure out the details of how do we make this system work in an organic no-till environment. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how all that came to be? Yeah. Um, so I actually first started to work in these systems, interestingly, in a very different environment when I was first on the faculty at New Mexico State University. Um, and that was back in, in 2003. And when I was brought on to the faculty at New Mexico State University, I uh, just by chance had the opportunity to you know, really dive deeply into organic agriculture with uh, being able to teach a class in organic agriculture that was based on a, a working uh, student CSA farm that was managed organically. Uh, and also had support even almost 20 years ago to to do organic research and receive some of the first federal funding that was uh, designated to to forward organic agricultural research. And working in New Mexico, um, that was quite a different environment than what we have in the the north central region, the the upper Midwest. And I was working in you know irrigated agricultural systems in an arid environment um, with, with very poor soils. Uh, and the way, because of the issues with water, uh, oftentimes we, the soil was left bare um, between uh, the intensive uh, cropping that, that was done. It was uh, a lot of uh, vegetable cropping that I was working with, um, onions and chili and cotton production. And you know, even again, 20 years ago, as I was driving around southern New Mexico. I mean, there were times where we could just see the the soil literally, you know, moving across the the land, uh, and the profound soil loss that was stimulated by um, the, the the winds and um, just the, the movement of the soil was was quite quite profound. So. I was uh, actually inspired uh, by work from uh, Ron Morse at Virginia Tech U uh, University, and he actually was one of the first people to look at using cover crops to reduce tillage in, in vegetable systems and looking at um, trying to design uh, strategies to keep our soils in place and to prevent this erosion that, again, was, was quite visible. To try to take some of the concepts that he was um, working on in Virginia and, and bring that to the irrigated systems in New Mexico. So even there, in a very, very different environment, had used uh, cover crops um, in both uh, with the ways that we're doing now with roller crimping, as well as winter killed cover crops, and then direct uh, transplanting of chili peppers into the, the killed residues. So it was... Uh, really early on in my career that I, I started to work in these systems. And when I moved to uh, the University of Wisconsin in uh, 2006, uh, there was another professor here, Dr. Josh Posner, who was very much an engineer, uh, a pioneer uh, in sustainable agriculture and, and organic ag research uh, early on at, at University of Wisconsin-Madison. And he had just within the, the past uh, couple years before I had uh, came to UW-Madison had bought a Rodale roller crimper. So between having those experiences already at New Mexico State and that interest and then coming to a, a university that had access to the equipment to allow me to do this in the systems I would be working in in Wisconsin, our, our larger row crop and, and dairy systems began working uh, in no-till research for organic producers in, in 2006, 2007. So 
at that time, I had the pleasure to work with Jeff Moyer from the Rodale Institute. So that that really gave me a unique opportunity from someone that you know, was an early leader in this research area um, and, and really was a mentor in terms of how to translate the, the research he was doing in Pennsylvania with the Rodale Institute to Wisconsin. So I really had several um, circumstances line up that, uh, that really created an ideal situation to begin this research and begin it in a way that, that really got me off on a, a solid footing. Um, and through my work, um, not only at our research station, but with farmers, I was able to learn a lot um, fairly quickly in terms of what were the limitations of the system um, and where were the key points to look at optimizing management to reduce risk uh, and, and have this system work over the largest range of environments uh, to create a, a more workable and, and profitable system for organic farmers. I find this really interesting that you've had a decade and a half of this research experience and you have certainly shared your uh, knowledge and the things that you've learned very widely and a lot of your information is readily accessible online. And yet, in spite of that pattern, in spite of the readily available information, I still see lots of farmers sharing information on social media. And I'm going to focus specifically on cover crop rye for just because that's what's on my mind at the moment. Although I think it's generally true of cover crops more largely. And there usually are the, the responses of people who are just starting out are usually on almost polar opposite ends of the spectrum. It's relatively seldom that I see responses in the middle, although it does happen. But often, and maybe this is just because of the nature of the medium of it being on social media, but often people are really exuberant and saying how awesome results they got and the yield response and the quality response they got from using cover crop rye and either killing it with herbicides or using a roller crimper. Or they're on the opposite end of the spectrum and talking about how this is an absolute crazy idea and doesn't work and I'm never going to try it again. Obviously, there's lots of room in the middle, and I'm sure that there are some of those experiences as well, but I'd love to get your perspective on what is often missed. Where are the opportunities to go wrong? That's a great question, and I, I get a lot of those emails and phone calls as well uh, with both success stories and, and people calling, and it's in very smart, uh, provocative ways and uh, um, intent to call and, and wanting to troubleshoot why why this why didn't this work on my farm uh, and you know there's been several I think uh, similarities I see when the system does does not work and I, I certainly don't understand all the nuance and all of you know, where there are specific challenges uh, related to unique environments and specific farms, but we definitely see some trends. Uh, and I think that the biggest pitfall that people fall into in trying this is that they're not willing to make more substantial changes in their system to set this specific practice up for success. Um, and and this is where I always want to be cautious in terms of my experience in Wisconsin and how that translates into the more uh, local environment that farmers may be experiencing in Iowa or Nebraska or Ohio or Pennsylvania, because uh, you know, the, the way that these cover crops will function are, is going to vary dramatically depending on latitude and, and depending on soil moisture. But what, what I have seen is that in Wisconsin, to make this system work, um, a farmer must be willing to take a different approach than I think what is the most typical way that they might sequence the crops that they are growing on their farm, which, which is often corn followed by soybeans um, and then potentially followed by a cereal grain and maybe a, a forage phase. The uh, corn followed by soybeans it does not allow for the cover crop to be planted early enough uh, in the post-harvest uh, period. So we're not even necessarily 
talking fall here. I mean, it really still is late summer that the cereal rye must be planted to create a a uh, weed suppressive mat, both while the rye is growing um, and also uh, post termination. And within our uh, systems that we've really designed to maximize the length of the growing season, particularly in the more northern latitudes, where we get into the fields as early as we can and, and typically pick a, a hybrid that is going to maximize the uh, entire uh, production season so that we can maximize yields, we don't leave ourselves a lot of time to plant another crop that is able to provide more of an ecosystem function, um, including cover crops and including cereal rye for roller crimping or other crops for roller crimping. So it takes a bit of a different shift in mindset that when we talk about maximizing productivity and maximizing profitability, we're not simply talking about the number of bushels per acre that you might be getting off of a field in a certain year, but it's more of this overall ecological perspective of how does that management allow you to have better weed management? How does that allow you to have fewer passes over the field? How does that allow you to create a system that allows you to reduce uh, not only fertilizer, but pesticides by creating a healthier crop? Um, so I think it takes a, a different mindset of that shifts from yield maximization to functional maximization. Um, and that includes the maximizing the functionality of the roller crimper system. So you're designing a rotation or even choosing the crop cultivar that allows you to get into the field earlier uh, in late summer, early fall, to me, that's the biggest sticking point um, that instead of having that mindset farmers are wanting to fit this system into more of business as usual and harvesting corn at the time that they typically would, trying to get cereal rye in and expecting it to perform as a roller crimper crop with soybean. And it, it unfortunately just doesn't. Thank you, Aaron. That's exceptional. And I think there's about half a dozen questions I'd like to ask and, and follow up to that. But in addition to the obvious uh, variety selection of uh, choosing earlier varieties. What are some of the innovations that you've seen farmers adopt to improve the overall system's performance and really allow it to be effective? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's looking at including crops uh, beyond corn and soybeans. So corn and soybeans, even in organic grain rotation, they tend to be our foundation crops and, and certainly are the crops that we have easiest access to markets. Um, and we tend to have higher prices. And we've certainly seen that with soybeans over the last year where we're, we're reaching prices, which really have been unheard of since we've seen a growth in the organic market. But again, we, we need to be looking at the resilience of the system over the longer term and not so much focused on the profitability of a single crop, particularly when we, we know that there will be swings in terms of you know, what, what are the prices that we're able to, to get for that crop. Uh, we're, we're much um, better off thinking about how am I going to create a system where I'm going to be able to stabilize my yield, stabilize my inputs, um, and look at creating a, a healthy system that is going to be more resilient to insect and disease pressure and lower my need for external uh, fertility inputs uh, if possible. Uh, so the, the changes that we've seen is, is crop diversification. So what crops can I put in my rotation that will allow me to prioritize my cover cropping like I prioritize my cash cropping. And I, I'm not saying that this is easy. It certainly takes innovation. Um, it may take uh, the purchase of different equipment, um, certainly may take 
more effort with respect to marketing. Um, but looking at what other cereal grains can I grow um, here in Wisconsin, we have the opportunity for canning vegetables. Um, sunflowers is an option, buckwheat, field peas for protein. What else can we grow beyond corn and soybeans that really allow us to add that diversification, which not only allows us to put in opportunities for cover crops, including for roller crimping, but that diversification helps foster other aspects of the ecological function of the system that is going to not only help with uh, you know, maximizing elements of the biological system, but also enhancing our ability to effectively manage weeds, insects, and disease. Coming back to overall ecosystem function. So what is, how has your research evolved over the last half a dozen years? It's, there, it took some time to establish the foundational principles and to see some early access and see that it get adopted into the field. Um, what, uh, what refinements have happened for you over the last couple of years and what refinements do you expect to see happening in the near future? We've been working more with looking at alternative crops to add to the diversification of the system. We've been looking more at adding phases of the crop rotation and not even, I mean, the overall crop rotation, because again, if we have different crops that have a, a shorter requirement for growth, whether it be field pea or buckwheat, that offers the opportunity to uh, put in an intensive cover crop phase that really helps with building the soil and suppressing weeds. So it's not necessarily giving up income off of those acres for the entire season, but really looking at amplifying what the value is by not only having the, the cash crop, but also the value that is brought in by the cover crop, soil building. And I've heard this sometimes termed as a, as a regen phase a regen year, um, where again, we're really focusing on the value that's derived from that practice, not from harvesting and, and selling the crop, but what is that going to contribute in terms of my effective weed management or the fertility additions uh, through adding a legume that, that could be achieved. So it's, it's really trying to put a mindset of of being able to quantify or at least have a thought process of what is the value of having that intensive cover crop regenerate re regenerative phase of uh, either a season or overall crop rotation. The other innovation that we've been working more and more with is having specific tools that are more allow for more success within these systems. And I mean, when we look at where innovation and resources and technology have evolved for agricultural systems, um, that technology and a lot of that research has been adapted to, you know, the, our typical systems that we we have been using. So our, our, our typical corn soybean systems, which do incorporate no-till practices, but in a very different way than these cover crop based approaches that are much more complex in terms of the amount of residue and uh, the, the timing of termination and what is needed to, to manage in these high biomass systems. So We've been working more and more with both our agricultural engineers here at the UW Madison, but also you know other partners as well from the private sector to look at what are some of the additional non-chemical tools um, and the modifications that we might make to our existing tools to allow us to be more successful with planting through these high residue systems, terminating these high residue systems, and allowing more flexibility to manage these systems effectively over a larger range of environments, and also in different conditions, um, even on the same environment across different years. So that, that innovation that's happening with uh, different sorts of, of technologies, um, whether it be mowing equipment or different types of roller crimpers, different ways of, of managing residue or modifying planters. Um, for, for us in our research, I, I think that that's where we've seen 
gains. It, it always feels like the gains are slow in agriculture, only having one uh, one chance every year to to do something different um, and then learn from that. Uh, but that's too where having this larger community of of farmers and practitioners and and other experts such as yourself is is just so valuable to be able to you know gain a understanding uh, across you know multiple approaches and multiple environments so that we could all learn together and and make progress quicker. What are you really excited about right now with with these various tools that you've been experimenting with? What is really standing out to you as having a lot of potential for success? While we've had you know quite a degree of success with organic no-till soybeans, and even with the challenges that I do hear reported from farmers to make that organic no-till system work with soybeans, and I, I do not at all um, discount those challenges. I know they are real, and I know that there are uh, circumstances where the system does not perform like people are hoping. Uh, and, and we do see higher weed pressure and uh, decreased yields from what we might see as optimal. And again, I, I think that we are able to better pinpoint why that is, whether it's later planting of the cereal rye that's optimal. So you know, planting after corn harvest in October is not going to work. That cover crop really needs to be planted sometime by mid-September. Um, planting that rye to thin as well with a lighter seeding rate is, is also an issue. Um, and then potentially not having the fertility that allows for rye growth is, is an, also an issue at times. But overall, the system, you know, if we do adhere to the different parameters that we know will allow the system to work, that early rye planting, that thicker seeding rate, um, and and managing overall that cover crop like we would our cash crop by ensuring that it has the right nutrients and soil environment it needs. I, I've seen... Um, I've seen a lot of success, um, not only within our trials, but with the farmers that we work with and the farmers that report back to me that the different experiences that they have. We have had more challenges with corn. And I, again, I don't want to get too bottlenecked into corn and soybeans as the only crops that, that we can grow in these systems. But they certainly, again, are the foundational crops of, of many organic grain rotations. Um, more um, south of us, Pennsylvania and North Carolina, um, using legume cover crops. I know that they've had some degree of success, but it's been a, a real challenge here in Wisconsin because of the limited legumes that we, we can use that not only will put on substantial biomass, but will also be susceptible to termination through mechanical means with a roller crimper. Um, we, we're really quite limited and, and limited in many cases to hairy vetch as, as the cover crop that fits the different parameters that we need to allow it to be a roller crimp crop. So with some of the equipment modifications that we've been trying, including inter-row crimpers and mowers, um, we are seeing more and more success within these uh, no-till corn systems. Uh, and I'm excited to see what our results are this year. It's certainly something that I don't think is is necessarily ready for adoption across a, a wider landscape. Um, I'm certainly hesitant to recommend it to farmers, and and if the farmers do want to uh, you know, try these different techniques, I always recommend that they start on a smaller scale with their eyes open in terms of what the risks are. Although I certainly don't want to discourage it either, because there's amazing innovation happening there with farmers and on individual farms that, again, I think really contribute to just our overall body of knowledge and, and how to make this work. But with some of these newer tools, we're able to more effectively terminate those legume cover crops, which allow us to get corn planted earlier um, and also, I think, limit some of the, the challenges that we see with the short growing season of the roller crimped systems with corn, um, as well as some of the challenges we've seen with termination. So again, we are making gains every year. I think you know, we're still at about 110 bushel an acre, which in Wisconsin is is not where we quite want to be in these systems. But um, I'm excited that we are still seeing a positive trajectory, even though we're not at the finish line yet. Yeah, there's still lots of room for improvement based on what you describe. But I also, it's my understanding that there are lots of farmers, um, individuals who have really gone the distance and are trying 
new things. In the case of corn, I'm thinking of Lauren Steinlog again and the group of farmers there in north central Iowa that are and northeastern Iowa that are now doing wide row corn, 60 inch corn, or, and intercropping and stuff like that. So I, I expect this conversation will probably be very different in five years from now because there's going to be such an accumulated body of experience and knowledge that is in the process of happening right now. Oh, I definitely agree. And that's, there is just so much innovation that's happening. Um, we've, we've also been doing some work on wide row corn and have had very promising results, um, work with interseeding into corn, different cover crops. And again, I've been really excited about some of the progress there and doing more work too on relay cropping and intercropping where we're putting a cereal grain and soybeans together and either harvesting those two crops together or sequentially. Um, and there are farmers that are doing that in practice and having quite a degree of success. So the innovation that we're seeing is quite inspiring. And, and I too think that, you know, as we look down the road five to 10 years, there is so much potential in terms of not only transforming our agricultural ecosystems, but also having a greater understanding of just the, the complexity and, and the drivers that, again, help with maximizing the, the biological function of that soil and then how that translates to both soil health, plant health, and, and finally, human and livestock health. Want to shift just a bit? We've been we've kind of been focusing on corn and soybeans. You mentioned some of the other crop potentials, um, sunflowers, and a number of other crops that you listed off. Where do you see the biggest opportunity for farmers to shift crop rotations away from corn and soybean orientation? Yeah, that's a great question, um, and and that is I think very regionally specific, uh, depending on where there's different market opportunities. I think that there are markets for cereal grains, um, especially more uh, specialty cereal grains that might be processed by smaller mills. So different uh, varieties of wheat um, and other specialty grains, uh, including for um, distilling and, and brewing as well as baking. I think oil seeds is another area that we're seeing a lot of um, interest and potential growth. Um, sunflowers for oil and, and winter camelina is another one that we're trying. Uh, I think that there is more of a recognition of our need to um, improve the resilience of our domestic oil seed supply, especially with some of the um, challenges we've seen with supply chains with COVID and, and some of the um, international conflict that has uh, arisen over the past year or so. That is somewhat dependent on infrastructure and processing capacity. But again, I, I, I see that as an area for growth and, and potentially um, expansion of, of some of that processing capacity as well. And then the market for proteins as well, plant-based proteins, and looking at where there might be growth in peas and, and other uh, edible beans is another opportunity. So it's, it's, it's again, very regional spe specific, um, somewhat depending on where there is processing capacity and, and how close you are to, I think, where the, the final end user is. Um, but there's there's certainly those markets, and it, it no doubt does take a, a bit more time um, and energy and innovation when it comes to exploring those markets. Uh, but they they are out there. Yeah, I think they are out there. And you know what I find interesting is I think there's tremendous potential for people to connect growers to the markets. Uh, I'm increasingly having conversations with small scale food companies who have who are maybe a couple of years old and who are developing really innovative plant ingredient based products that are looking for healthier higher quality ingredients that are organically grown or regeneratively grown and they don't know how they don't know where to go they don't know who to talk to and so there's a significant gap there that i think there's is so ripe for opportunity for people to step forward and start having those conversations when when you think about the agricultural landscape and the people who are involved in, in farming in different ways, what is something that you believe to be true about agriculture that is very different from the mainstream view? Well, that's a great that's a great question. I, I think that there are ways that we can approach our agricultural systems that can be quite beneficial to, to the multiple goals that we have with respect to our land management, 
supporting farmer livelihoods, supporting vibrant communities, supporting a, a, a strong, uh, stable food supply, plentiful food supply of healthy foods, but also supplying and providing our other benefits that we want to see, including water quality and enhancing biodiversity and just the promoting the, the beauty of our natural landscape that is is we just see all, all over the, the U.S. in terms of um, just how incredible um, our landscapes are and, and the beauty of our natural environment. Um, agriculture, through the what we've been learning about regenerative practices, and I, I think this is true too, as, as you were saying, with the interest of increasing interest of industry with respect to understanding where they're buying from and purchasing healthy food that has been produced in a way that is creating a nutrient dense product that uh, fosters these these other broader goals i see that continuing i see that continuing from the interest of consumers and then that following to the interest in the companies and the innovators that are producing those products. So I, I don't think that it's mutually exclusive to be able to produce high quality, plentiful food and reach these these other goals of supporting family farms and supporting rural communities. And again, the amazing natural environment that, that we live in. Yeah, there is, there's a lot of opportunity to step forward, that's for sure. And the reality is we live in a moment in time where uh, leadership is desperately needed, and it's an opportunity for us as farmers to step forward and be the leaders in this conversation, or to collectively drag our feet and not be the innovators and be perceived in a negative rather than in a positive light from the from the uh, population at large. So I think it's really it's really our choice of how we want to step forward and step into that space. And there's just so many inspiring farmer leaders that are really stepping up to that role of of innovating and and showing how we can do things differently and, and being successful at uh, being able to show how we can do things differently. So it's it's really quite an inspiration to be able to work with the farmers that I just have the the opportunity and the privilege to work with. Yeah, there are many amazing people all working together for the same thing, which is very inspiring and there's a lot of fun to be a part of that. Aaron, what is what is a topic that uh, you would like to speak more about be, but you're not uh, you're not often asked to or you're hesitant to for whatever reason? Boy, I think uh, understanding I'm hesitant to talk about this primarily because I still feel like I'm at a, just such an early stage of my own understanding, having more of a, a training in agronomy um, than soil science. But uh, I, I just I find it so fascinating uh, again how how our soil environment, the soil ecosystem, how complex that environment is, and just how how at the tip of the iceberg we are at our understanding of the interactions between plants uh, and the biological environment around them. Um, some of the research that we're more recently doing um, in collaboration with Dr. Zach Friedman, who is a fairly new professor here at the University of Wisconsin, a soil biologist, is understanding, uh, trying to understand through a series of experiments how different cultivars of plants, um, particularly in this case, we're using carrot as a model system, uh, actively change and, and promote the biology that surrounds the, the root system, the rhizosphere, um, and, and how we might, using that understanding, be able to promote systems that are uh, resilient and promoting a, a, a biology that helps with the, the overall function of the system. And I think, you know, as I look at my own career and, and my interest in plant biology and agriculture, I, I originally came in more as a wildlife biologist in my environmental interests, thinking that, you know, plants were a very passive actor in the environment, um, that they uh, were something that were part of the landscape, but that they weren't active players, like is, is more visible when you look, think of a, a deer or a frog or a squirrel, you can visibly see how they're altering the environment. But plants, um, they're also 
altering the environment under which um, in which they are are living. And I, I we haven't looked at that with respect to the sorts of of research and uh, promoting our understanding as as much as we should be um, to again understand how we're promoting function. So just overall, um, our understanding of soil biology, but particularly those interactions between plants and, and how uh, plants can respond to their environment, the stressors that are put upon them, and you know limitations within the environment with respect to nutrients or and other factors that create resilience and strength, how, how they're responding to be able to adapt to um, those conditions. It's, it's such a fascinating area of, of research. And again, it's an area that I'm hesitant to talk in because I, I feel like a novice when it comes to the science, but it's it's such a fascinating area that I think will be one of the, the uh, aspects of furthering our knowledge that will allow for more transformation of, of how we do agriculture. You know, it's really interesting. Something about the way that you said that. I've I've studied the way that plants change the environment, the, speaking in terms of the meteorological environment, the weather and climate and so forth. I've studied how plants change the soil environment pretty extensively. But something about the way that you framed that and said that just now reminded me or made me think of plants in a way that I never have before. And it, when we think about... Um, ecological landscapes, there's this whole conversation around biological cascades and keystone species and even super keystone species. So there's there's this story that's fairly popular. I'm imagining lots of our listeners have, have heard of it or can certainly find it. And it's the story of how wolves changed the landscape of Yellowstone National Park and how the presence of the wolves as predators changed the browsing behavior of elk, which uh, then resulted, I'm giving a very condensed overview here, uh, changed the browsing behavior of the elk. They, they didn't graze as heavily in the valleys anymore because they were more vulnerable. That allowed the growth of aspen groves along the streams, which created an environment for beaver. The beaver moved in, started damming the rivers, waterfowl moved in. And the, the short version is it completely changed the hydrology of the landscape of Yellowstone National Park and I'm, I'm sure that had impacts on the weather of that local ecology as well, simply by introducing wolves as, and, and so wolves are often, in, in this particular context, they would be referred to as a keystone species. And we are learning about this cascading effect that one of these species can have. And it's important for us to remember that as humans, and our interactions with the landscape as we are and farming and so forth, that we're actually a super keystone species because we are the ones that used our capacity to remove wolves from the landscape in the first place and then reintroduce them. And how does that manifest in our farming operation and the way that we are present here in the world? But that's a bit of a sidebar. The, the point that you made, or for some reason, this this story, this way of thinking about the impact of a species on a land, on a macro landscape, we have tended to think of plants as being relatively passive, but what if in fact, particularly in, in some contexts, in some environments, plants are a keystone species and have this biological cascade effect that has very wide ranging rippling consequences that we may not be thinking about. Yeah, now that's, that is a great way of thinking of it. And I think on on more of a, maybe a, a local field level, and this is another area that, again, I, I'm only hesitant to talk about this because I feel like it goes a bit far further afield of my direct expertise, but a question that I often get from farmers. And I think, again, it's a fascinating area of research that I, I really want to see more work done is uh, this uh, understanding of how plants and particularly uh, weed species, I, I think there is we can think of that interaction in in two ways. Um, you know how are how is the our agricultural systems? Uh, how are they 
our practices, how are they promoting different weed species and what do weed species tell us about potential both strengths and weaknesses in our management, but also potentially, you know, what are those weed species doing that are potentially altering the system? whether it's a different um, acquisition of, of nutrients or looking at potentially altering some aspects of the soil physical structure. But I, I, I do think that there are so many different potential interactions and patterns that are in our agricultural systems that I think farmers have instinctively have been seeing some of these patterns by being managers of their land and and working their fields uh, but you know from a scientific perspective being able to better understand you know, and even from a management perspective of what cover crops can we grow that might be able to more actively alter the soil environment by promoting different aspects of soil biology or differentially accessing nutrients throughout the soil profile or influencing the mineralization of different nutrients or again, vice versa, being able to inform us in terms of um, you know, where are there either challenges and strengths of our soils that we can either uh, promote or uh, respond to, that's just, I think, such a potentially valuable area of, of research that, again, we, we I think there's a lot of observation that can help inform that research, but there is just a, a lack of more structured, rigorous data to be able to more definitively describe what is, is going on. Yeah, I, I actually think there's room for the development of a lot more of that research and the refinement of that. But there is a lot of that out there. When we look at the uh, the research on defining disease suppressive soils, for example, and the, the impact that various uh, root systems of different plants and different crops have on that and how the soil microbiome can change, there is some of that out there. And there's enough out there to infer a lot more, but there's still so much that we don't know. And, and then there's what I find really intriguing is uh, how the soil microbiome is managed differently in different cropping systems that, um, if it were understood, would be relevant and could be applied so much more broadly than what it is. And so one, one example of this that comes to mind is um, this technique that is known as ASD, anaerobic soil disinfestation. And this was developed most recently, I think it has quite some history going back into the 60s and 70s with different uh, cultural management practices. I don't think it was called ASD back then, if I'm not mistaken. But it's been developed or refined most recently in the Netherlands in the last eight or ten years as a replacement for fumigation and then has been brought to the United States West Coast and California. And ASD is, I'll give a, an oversimplified version, it is the feeding of soil biology, a source of very quickly available carbohydrates and a small amount of protein in an anaerobic environment. And so in California, this involves, I think there's in the Netherlands and in California, there's different feedstocks that are used. Some might use corn starch or potato starch and very soluble carbohydrates at fairly large application rates, a few hundred to a few thousand pounds per acre and then covering the soil with a sheet of plastic to create an anaerobic environment. And that has the effect of completely changing the soil microbiome to a very intensive disease suppressive microbiome to the degree that it's even called anaerobic soil disinfestation. And when we realize that the root systems of some plants and some crops can have that same effect to an equivalent or even greater degree than this practice can, then now that becomes an idea that is transferable to any cropping system without nearly the costs that are used in these intensive vegetable production systems. So there's there's just so much there. There's there's so much there for us to to unpack and to learn about and to implement on a much larger scale. 
Yeah, that is a great example of uh, yeah, just how we can use the power of again, how plants naturally interact with their environment to help solve some of the challenges um, in terms of management of our systems that will move us away from reliance on uh, chemical inputs um, and all the unintended impacts of, of applying um, those inputs onto the land. Aaron, where can people find out more about the research that you have done in organic no-till systems and uh, all the great work that you have done? So our website, um, it's you can find our website by Googling the acronym OGRAIN, O-G-R-A-I-N. And OGRAIN stands for the Organic Grain research and information network. Um, and that's our extension program that uh, is focused on providing farmers the, our research related to organic grain production, but also creating a community of organic grain producers to facilitate um, people learning from each other and um, understanding you know, what different perspectives are and what people's experiences are. So as if you Google O-Grain, you can find our research summaries, our research reports, and also see where we have different educational events, including our winter conference or O-Grain conference coming up here in, in Madison, Wisconsin at the end of January. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for sharing your wisdom and knowledge that you've gained with our entire audience. I really appreciate you being here and all the work that you do. And I look forward to having more conversations again in the future. Thank you. Me too. It's been wonderful to be able to um, talk with you and, and you know, share, share some of our thoughts together. The team at AEA and I are dedicated to bringing this show to you because we believe that knowledge and information is the foundation of successful regenerative systems. At AEA, we believe that growing better quality food and making more money from your crops is possible. And since 2006, we've worked with leading professional growers to help them do just that. At AEA, we don't guess, we test, we analyze, and we provide recommendations based on scientific data knowledge, and experience. We've developed products that are uniquely positioned to help growers make more money with regenerative agriculture. If you are a professional grower who believes in testing instead of guessing, someone who believes in a better, more regenerative way to grow, visit advancingecoag.com and contact us to see if AEA is right for you. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to working with you.